All right, good morning, everyone. We've had an exciting morning already here at Fine and Dandy Acres. Our barn kitty, who I did manage to capture and crate yesterday, uh, decided this morning that she would start spewing out kittens and she would ignore them. Luckily, we uh, got to the barn early enough to uh, revive and uh, warm up all the little cold kitties, and they are now in the house with Mama, and we've, we're up to five, so everybody's happy. So, uh, today is the last day of our Heart Week focus here on Facebook and Instagram, and I have a good friend, I, I'm hoping I can call Nate a good friend, uh, yeah. with me as my guest today, Nate Estes. And um, Nate, tell us a little bit about your group, the, the Mighty Hearts group, um, how you came to, to make this group, what it is, and, and what your focus is, because I, I think it's such an awesome thing <laughs> yeah thank you um yeah our well how it came about was like many people who deal with mitral valve disease with their dogs it's you know it's a common thing it's like what eight million dogs in the u.s alone yeah so our dog was diagnosed with early onset mitral valve disease at eight and well five at five and a half and that's when we went to the doctor, got the whole diagnosis. You know, your dog's going to be dead in a year. And I'm like, she's five and a half years old. I mean, there's something, got to be something. So like many pet parents, you know, that you deal with, uh, they don't settle for there's nothing you can do or harsh alternatives. So they look for other ways, you know, to combat what they're dealing with because they truly love their animals like they're their children. So you start digging and researching and you start finding things and then you realize, you know, wow, there's something. So that's kind of what I did is I, I found that there was a doctor in Japan that's doing the surgery. And at the time he was doing it in France. And that's kind of when I started, you know, doing the research through tragedy, like most of us do and putting the pieces together. And that's when we kind of, you know, wanted to do more and build the resources for this, uh, um, you know, for what we went through. I didn't want anyone else to go through as much of it that we had to alone. So it was kind of a, a um, something that was just born through tragedy like most, and we just wanted to make it better for people in the future. So did Zoe have her first surgery in um, France? Yeah, she had it in 2016 in France with Dr. Masami Wetsi, uh, who is... He was operating mainly out of Japan, but he was doing it in France uh, with that team at, at that time. Um, so he was kind of both places. So you get in where you can, because you know this disease is unpredictable. Right. So you kind of want to just get in where you can. Even waiting six months for the whole process to get into Japan because the requirements of what they entail for a rabies-free country. It's uh, nobody wants to wait six months because you don't have that time sometimes. Exactly. So how long did it take you to get in uh, for the program in France? Like two or three months. Still two or three months. So what exactly is the surgery that is being performed for these dogs? Um, <clears throat> basically, it's just uh, where they go in and they lay uh, gore latex sutures, you know, over the uh, cordae tendine, which is, you know, they break and they start. And, and they're unpredictable and they can break at any time. And that's when the, the leaflets on the mitral valve start flapping around because of those breaking and the reshaping of the, of the leaflets of the mitral valve, which, you know, starts to lead to further progression of the disease where the blood goes in and out of the wrong directions. So it starts to kind of flow out and then in, and it just gets, you know, worse and worse and worse. And what they do is they, uh, repair that using the cordae tendine to re-strengthen and structure the cords that broke. They replace sometimes seven, you know, total wow. to uh, hold those in to the physical heart that's still progressive because it's a progressive disease, you know. Right. Um, so it's still going to progress because they're not changing the heart, unfortunately. Right. So it, they, they just repair it, get it back down to the first stage of that disease, and they hold it into place structurally through the, 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 or latex and the, you know, the sutures and stitching they do around the valve to reshape that. So it gets a nice seal close. 
So uh, they're putting in this, this latex, do the dogs have to take um, any kind of medications to prevent them from reacting to that, having an, an autoimmune reaction or their immune system wanting to spit it out? Um, you typically, yes. Yeah, the, the, they put them on Plavix, which is a blood thinner okay. for like about a month, sometimes a little longer, but typically only about a month um, to prevent blood clotting. So okay. it's always a factor, but um, I will tell you though that Japan's surgical success rates as of last year is like ninety six percent, and that's discharge. So ninety six percent of the dogs that have the surgery are be are surviving and doing well enough to to go home. Yes. Do we have any statistics on how long the surgical repair lasts or how many? So after I met you uh, and you started talking about me in your group, and we're going to talk more about your group, but um, I ended up with a lot of clients who came to me with their dogs that had been through the procedure. And I actually had a couple of clients who had had more than one dog go through the procedure, which just floors me uh, because it's not cheap. Wow. Um, but some of them, they're, you know, one of the dogs did very well and the other dog did okay, but then had a complication a month later and, um, you know, they lost the dog to something potentially related, but a lot of times not even related. Do we have any idea, um, what kind of complications can be seen, you know, weeks to months after the surgery is done? Well, it's, I mean, generally... In my personal experience, from what I've seen, I don't see many dogs having many complications other than the blood clots. And of course, sometimes pancreatitis, you know, early on while they're in, in the hospital, they go through those bouts and then they have to do blood transfusions. And that's for purpose. That's kind of why they do blood typing tests before they go. Right. Um, they want to know what, you know, in Japan, I guess, uh, negative blood type is harder to come by. So they have to get their families to come in to don you know, donate blood ahead of time and schedule people in to have that surgery, you know, done while they have that good supply of that rare blood type. Okay. So that's kind of the worst thing they do is just blood transfusion. Uh, you know, you got to watch the platelets uh, come back up because they're very, very low. And it's a battle of fighting those numbers to come back and getting them to eat and finally and, and start sustaining. And then their numbers climb, climb, climb. And But other than like major complications, for the most part, I haven't seen too many things. I mean, obviously some dogs, uh, just don't do well with surgery period. Right. Uh, regardless, you know, I think it's more the health of the dog at the time when they go, yeah. if they're really strong in health and, and they can get through all the other stuff and, and they're fine. And so I think, uh, some dogs have had issues where maybe the, the body is inflamed, you know, and, and maybe rejected, uh, the material around it. It's, it's a rare thing, but it could happen. Okay. So how, if somebody decides, first of all, where is the surgery being done now? I don't think we have anywhere in the U S that is doing this. No, it's just currently it's done in Yokohama, Japan at the Jasmine clinic with Dr. Masami Wachi and his team. They've been doing it for over 20 years now. Uh, wow. they, they do seven surgeries a week for 20 wow. years. Wow. So, and that's just, the. Uh, the people that we help come along um, in the U.S. are probably like one percentile of their numbers. Really? So they're really busy within just Japan alone and in the outskirts of those countries uh, where they're getting clients to come in. So, I mean, I think maybe it's 10 percent of their business is from the U.S. So it's really, you know, that's that's uh, <laughs> they're busy. Yeah. And then there's uh, the Royal Veterinarian College, RVC, Queen Mother Hospital. They Dr. Dan Brockman performs the surgery there. He's been doing it for a couple of years. And with the current, you know, world situation, we'll call it, uh, they had to shut down the, their practice from doing this for over a year. And they, they're starting to open it back up now and open it up to foreigners. Wow. So they are doing, I think, about four months. They, they were doing one or two a week, I believe, um, before all this. So hopefully they'll ramp up and they'll go into more as time goes on, but they kind of scaled back with everything, with all the budgetary cuts and, you know, the universities and the bureaucratics of all this and what's going on in the world today. 
So they kind of had to scale back. Yeah. And there's really unfortunate. So is that the only mm-hmm. place in the UK that's doing it? Or is there a second one? There's a second one. Dr. Poppy Bristow just started her clinic. She worked at the RVC and assisting in the surgeries and then eventually started doing surgeries on her own. There she started doing uh, quite a few. And then she moved on to the DWR clinic, which is the Dick White Referral Clinic in Cambridgeshire, UK. And she started to perform that. She did one of our members so far. And sadly, she had some medical issues of her own and she had to step back with the program. So it's been kind of hold. But they're interviewing people now on Zoom calls with the doctors and scheduling people. So that's happening. And I think we're having people go in about a week or so. Wow. So they are doing surgeries. And and she's had uh, from our families posting to our Facebook community uh, group page. She's probably she's done a couple of at least so far in this program. Um, but when she was at the RVC, she's done some, and those docs are still alive two, three years after that surgery. That's so I have at least numbers. I know that she can perform this and dogs can live longer after what she's done. So I've seen that, you know, in our community ourselves. So I can at least vet that the statistics, that's a hard thing. Cause with such an early program, you don't really have numbers. So you can't really right. spit things out there. Right. And with Japan, they were due to release numbers and all their, their current updates because the numbers are from like 2012 and they were due to release more stuff. But then this world situation happened and they kind of stopped and but they're starting to ramp up and, and we'll be releasing more um, data on how they're doing in information. Probably, I would hope maybe at the latest ACVIM. Okay. So what stage uh, of mitral valve disease would the dog have to be in to be a candidate for surgery? They really like, obviously, if you're in stage C, congestive heart failure, once that stage happens, you know, the muscle gets weak and it's pretty much a fight from that point to keep them stable. And depending on the progression, you know, you've dealt with that. Right. You know, progression could be a a good, uh, uh, good for years or, you know, a year or less. So. Typically, stage C is a place they want to start, but also Japan has has gotten so good at this, they have kind of suggested B, I want to call it B2 plus, because you have heart enlargement already, you're on medication. Um, They won't take candidates, the hearts are not enlarged, of course, because they kind of monitor with your doctor and they'll, I've seen them reject people and say, no, it's not time. Um keep monitoring it. And then the people, you know, they keep doing that, doing the uh, follow-up echocardiograms. And eventually they hit a point where it's time to go. And then they tell them it's time, but that allows them time to prepare and us to get them prepared. Right. So if someone had a dog that was in B2 and they thought that maybe they would want to, to get this procedure done, they really should be starting to look at getting all of their titers and their vaccination status and everything lined up. Yeah. You want to, what they require is the, well, the titer tests and all that, that's just because you're in a rabies free country. Right. The UK doesn't really require that. They just, you have to be up to date on your rabies shot and microchip, of course, to travel. Then you just work through the USDA on your paperwork and your health certificate through your veterinarian to be able to export your dog out of the country. With Japan, it's a little bigger of a beast because they're a rabies free country and they do require that fab and titer test from Kansas City. So members have to, you have to be up to date on your, on your rabies, your microchip. And so basically if you have that first rabies shot, you're up to date, you have your microchip. They actually want you to do one more, even though you're already up to date, which is to me, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And how we're pumping them full of that unnecessary with your tighter shows, it's passable. Yeah. Passable. They don't recognize that. Right. So unfortunately they have to have that two series shots total, an active one and then another one. And then, you know, the, the microchip. And if they're not microchip, it's a whole nother mess. Yeah. Cause now you have to, get microchipped. Uh, they do count the, if you're not microchipped, they do count that. It's not like, like in the UK, if you weren't microchipped and you got microchipped, that resets your rabies. And now you have to get another one. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's great. 
So we're having to deal with that. And um, I like to use, I know you carry it in your store that the, I think they call it rebalance now. You know, the, the, uh, that's the, uh, the anti-vaccinosis. Oh, right, right, right. Is it rebalance right now? I have no idea. Is it, you're talking yeah. about the Adored Beast product? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it. <laughs> that's what she sprays for like over vaccination and stuff with the Thuja and all that. Right. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. So if, if someone thought they were interested in having this surgery or investigating it, what would be their first steps? Uh, typically they would contact the doctors directly. Um, we assist them. If they find us, we give them the information on how to contact the doctors. It's all on our website, mightyheartsproject.org. Um, travel to London and Japan page is where it's specifically for each place to contact the centers directly with what are their requirements with the x-rays, the echocardiograms. They, they want to ultrasound because they obviously want to rule out any other conditions. Um, prior to surgery. Yeah. Cause they don't want to give you a date to find out you're riddled with cancer or your lungs aren't working well. Obviously if you're going to go on cardio, you know, on bypass, um, they want you to be strong. And so they look for things and they look for like Cushing's, which if you have Cushing's and it's controlled, that doesn't eliminate you from surgery. It just has to be controlled. Right. So they kind of want all that. And then they would contact them directly with uh, all of that. They prefer to work through cardiologists directly because if anything's missing in the records, it's much easier for them to contact the cardiologist to give them that information um, versus going through you and then now having to wait for the cardiologist for you to contact them. It's a mess. So they really would prefer to be organized to, to go directly through your doctors. And unfortunately, some doctors uh, don't know how to drop box or provide large data like that. So, or if they provide those links, uh, you know, that, that our doctors here sometimes do, you go to a web page, click on it and it views it. So those don't work internationally sometimes. Because they're they're depending on their their IT structure, it cuts off that that access out of the country. Perfect. So Dropbox, you know, is what they do. Google Drive, and sometimes our families have to gather the data, and we help them uh, gather it and figure it out to put it in a Dropbox and send it to them. Do you find in general that the cardiologists uh, are aware of this surgical procedure? I would say now a lot more are aware through our families um, going there. And if they weren't aware, our families kind of educate them and tell them about our site and they find our site and then they're like, wow. And, and, you know, it, it, it's something that they, uh, they're pretty impressed with because they didn't realize it exists. And I mean, I've been to ACBAM and a couple of things, and I guess some of them don't go to those, but they talk about it all the time repair and, 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 you know, they're trying to do replacements in other surgery centers, but, but it's discussed though, but sometimes I, I do find doctors that don't even know about it or they're not very supportive of it because they don't themselves don't know the full details or haven't looked into the full details of this. Right. So then they're very skeptical. They're standoffish. They don't want to deal with it. Um, but once they send enough patients through and through and they see the results for themselves, every checkup, they're pretty damn impressed. And that's yeah. when I've seen doctors do 180s and say, and they're totally behind it now. And when they weren't. Yeah. I, I mean, I find that a lot of them are reluctant to open that door and have that conversation. And do you think part of that is because they think that people won't spend that kind of money on their animals? Yeah, I think so. I, I really do. Uh, I mean, and I get it because it really hurts. I mean, just to go for, one heart failure episode is what, like three, four thousand dollars in the US? Yeah. So that can, I mean, who, not a lot of people have more than a few thousand lying around, if that. I mean, I didn't. Right. So, with, and that, that leads into pet insurance. You should all have pet insurance early on, especially with breeds like this. Would pet insurance cover this heart surgery? They won't cover it unless it's done in the US. Oh. So, <laughs> to them, well, and then it was going to come to Florida, which sadly it's not because the, the program decided not to go forward with it. And the doctor that was leading the program um, left and moved back to the UK. So sadly, that program shut down and they decided not to do it, even though they have old remnants on their website that they need to get rid of. Mm. 
So what is the average cost? And does it differ depending on which country they go to to have the surgery done? I would say it's pretty similar because with uh, the DWR clinic, it's about 17,500 pounds, which equates to 22,170 US dollars. And that includes pre-op, post-op. And if your dog even stays longer than the seven day, seven to 10 day requirement of after the surgery, they, let's just say they have complications and they stay for 14 days. That's included. Oh, great. We're I'm pretty surprised because I think like with the RVC, it's about that same cost. But if you stay longer than those days, then that's extra. Mm. And well, they're about 18,500 US dollars, about 18,000. But uh, if you stay longer than the seven days, then obviously there's more and then medications added and, you know, things get added to it. It, it, You can have a couple thousand unexpected if things, you know, progress or if there's like complications or something that require them to do more stuff. But typically 23, 25 is pretty comfortable to be traveling, you know, all all the different costs involved to, to stay in an Airbnb for like three weeks. Right. So, and I know that you sadly had to have your little girl go through surgery twice. And uh, so the first surgery was done in France and the second surgery, I believe was done in Japan. So can you talk about why she had to go for a second surgery and you know, what the outcome of that was? Yeah, basically she, you know, as I said, she was five and a half early onset with this disease. And typically it shows its head at what, nine, 10, 11, maybe. And that's what I've seen with a lot of the families we help. It it usually starts about that time is the regular kind of, I want to say the regular, the regular progression stage of that I've seen. And she was five and a half and she was B2 at her first surgery, not much damage, but they replaced, you know, a couple cords and she did well for like two and a half, two years, and then started having issues where her numbers were increasing again. And then we started looking more into that and obviously starting the nonprofit and everything, what we're doing with Mighty Hearts, we know the doctors well, we work with all of them very closely and they evaluated her records and, and Dr. Masami and his team. And they said, it looks like one of the cords, the artificials came off of her heart, mm. which, you know, a weak heart and progresses. And I guess she was just quickly advancing regardless of, so we're holding it back basically. And so it detached and it caused the regurgitation to increase again on the left side, which made things go downhill quickly. And they were telling me probably less than a year or a year, she probably would go into heart failure and she was just heading downhill and she, it was going pretty fast actually. And we saw it and, and it wasn't normal. It was quick. And, so he recommended us to go back to Japan in 2019, February, to do a secondary surgery. They don't normally do have to do two surgeries. They've done like six of them before. And I think only one or two, well, only one, Zoe really, uh, lived uh, a couple of years after surgery. Most, you know, a year had other issues, right-sided issues, and it just didn't go well because their hearts were just so diseased and heading downhill. Right. So with her, it just quickly uh, head downhill with her, even after her second surgery, you know, we got her two years after surgery and then she started having, well, she previously going into surgery, she had pulmonary hypertension. And it was like in the fifties. Sometimes it was in the eighties. So it was all over the place and we were battling that. And, um, you know, her tricuspid, sometimes after surgery, they get a little bit of tricuspid leak, not much to make a difference, but sometimes it can happen. And, over time, you know, the right-sided balance throws them into right-sided failure or enlargement or difficulties on that side. And so it's like a balancing act. And with her, it was just left, right. And, and it just kept, her heart was tired from two yeah. surgeries. And, you know, what, what Japan says is we're doing this surgery to buy time, like four to five years. It's not a cure from the disease itself because that's still unknown. But for now, it was just uh, buying time. And that's what we did. And she had two great quality years of no problems. And then boom, everything started going downhill. And it was the medication dance, you know, and fighting to keep her kidneys and her liver and all the numbers stable. And 
Right. And then at some point you, you reach a point where it's, uh, you have to think about them and, and just say, we did everything we could and now it's not right. So we, right. we had to make a decision. Right. Yeah. Which is very sad, but I mean, certainly, uh, you could never look back and say, I didn't do everything that was, it, oh, yeah. uh, you know, even in the realm of possibility. So Nate, you, uh, you speak about this, you know, right-sided failure, pulmonary hypertension, life's left-sided failure, tricuspid, mitral valve. You speak like you have a medical background, and I don't think you do. What is it that no. you do for a living, and what is your background? I, I work in information technology. Pretty much, well, I support people, I guess. I've <laughs> been doing it all my life. But I help with computer challenges and servers and networks and stuff like that, and um, our, you know, clients where I, I go around fixing stuff. So primarily IT, my brain is that way. So this is an IT guy, but he speaks so, so knowledgeably about this heart disease because he's lived with it for so many years and helped so many people and been so involved with the doctors who were doing this work, which I think is amazing. So let's talk about the Mighty Hearts Project. What exactly is it? Where do people get more information about it? And what kind of support does the Mighty Hearts Project need? Yeah, well, Mighty Hearts Project basically came about, obviously, through all what I mentioned before. And it was just to help families navigate this process. Because if it's something, nobody wants to go to surgery, first of all. We don't advocate to push people to surgery. Because who the hell wants to go do that, especially uh, open heart bypass? I mean, Jesus. So... We help people that are going down that threshold that don't have any other choices. You've done everything you could holistically and things start going downhill and you know that the dog's going to progress and probably be dead. And, and most aren't willing to say goodbye at nine, 10, 11 and, and want to look at the surgery option because it's all we have besides the supplements and, and good feeding and stuff. And, um, so they look at this option and it's not an easy option to, to go do. If you've ever had to take a dog out of the country, that's hard enough, right. but trying to navigate the paperwork and the process and going through your vets and the USDA and 10 days before you go, you got to get it all authorized. And um, between uh, working with these doctors to get all your paperwork in order to like in Japan to notify the quarantine office where you have to let them know 40 days you're coming. If you don't let them know 40 days you're coming, they don't let you in, even if you show up. So there's like processes and that could just, in our cases with time, with what we're buying to get to surgery, uh, that could be a death sentence to your dog. If you mess up the paperwork for quarantine right. and we've had it happen where people um, have done something wrong, we've had to help them fix it. And thank God we were able to, but, uh, and sometimes the centers are lenient and, you know, here in the U.S. and fix things. But um, we just help people get that all together so that if it's something you're going to do, we're going to help you all the way with the support of that through our Facebook uh, Mitro Valve, uh, Mighty Hearts MED community. They, they all post their stories and they help each other out. And have you seen this? What are you dealing with? And like during the preparation stages, uh, even if people aren't even going to surgery, I think. We still want to help them manage through food, supplements, good quality, like what you're doing where you're showing that you can buy time. Even if you can't afford to go to surgery, you're still showing people that you're able to fight the congestive heart failure and hold it back for as long as you can. Tell the body, you know, until you can't. Right. Just like with the repair. So is, uh, is Mighty Hearts Project, is it a, a nonprofit group? Yes, 501c3. It is a 501c3. And so if people were to donate to the Mighty Hearts Project, where does that, what does, what is that money used for? Yeah, basically we are using it for the educational purposes of our website to build that information, to help them with all the processes of all of this surgery stuff. Um, we use it also, we travel to conventions like we've been to yours. <laughs> to educate ourselves with the knowledge of how to help these people, help them with fresh feeding and supplements and just trying to learn how to fight this disease. And eventually, um, sadly, when we just got the 501c3, uh, this worldwide issue happened. Yeah. <laughs> so we couldn't do much. 
So everything we, we had plans for halted, but I, I'm working on the back end of redoing the website and the education um, to hopefully put together a really good 3D video that guides people what is microbiome disease, shows them the whole process through 3D animation of how this uh, happens, and then eventually how the repair works. Because I really want to help in the educational part and the nutritional part. And eventually I would like to lead it to a place where we can do those studies like you want to do, the holistic studies that cost a lot of money. <laughs> we know that it costs uh, when big pharma and all these people buy it, they kind of skew their results the way that they want them versus a holistic study that's controlled, that's told the truth on, on what can help. So I'd like to gear towards that and maybe Dr. Palmquist can help me with his, with his organization. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I mean, it's just, it's amazing that this resource is available for families who are interested and can somehow manage to make it work. I mean, uh, we thought about it with Pookie and thank goodness we didn't do it because she ended up dying of something totally unrelated to her heart failure. And she stayed in stage D for about six, seven years. Um, so, but you know, when we originally considered the idea of taking her to Japan, I was so overwhelmed thinking, because I know the paperwork that goes into, I'm an uh, APHIS accredited veterinarian, and I know the paperwork and the hoops that you have to jump through and the timelines to get your dog out of the country, particularly to a rabies free area, just even to go for a trip, let alone to go for a surgical procedure and have to stay there for weeks where you don't speak the language. You, uh, you, one of the things that is difficult for people to even navigate, people that I've talked to, like Issa Randall with Lucky, uh, finding a food that she could feed the dog while she was doing the traveling process. You know, if you want something that you can travel with, that's lightweight, that you're going to be able to get into the country, uh, that is organic, whatever it is that you're trying to do, even that little piece of it, how to feed your dog during the whole transportation process. Uh, so, you know, the fact that you've actually been there, I think probably makes it a little easier for you to tell people, Hey, there's this coffee shop on this corner and there's a grocery store on this corner. This is where you can go get this and that. I mean, that's very helpful for people. It's just the little details that can really just throw you off. Yes. I know where all the pet diapers are <laughs> and all the ads and all the pet stores. And, but yeah, that's the big thing though, is, is going into surgery and, transitioning your dog to something that I guess you know a lot of the clinics including these don't like raw food because right. not not at the time of the procedure Japan sure. is supportive of the raw food and the feeding and they get it but uh, obviously they don't want to deal with bacteria and, and, and introducing things in their clinic so they're careful and you know all of that so they uh transitioning them to something that is still very healthy but easy to make yourself or bring with you is important because you know after this surgery the last thing you want them to do is have diarrhea and and, right. and going through the recovery of the inflammation and then now you're causing all that through right. switching all of a sudden to well crappy food like science site and royal canaan and all that crap right so they uh yeah that's a challenge is getting them is helping them to find something to transition to that's that's what we'd like to help them with too is yeah. transition stay healthy on healthy foods use a lot of we, we reference you a lot because the diets you do do make a real difference good yeah and so it's just it's being and and you are you're a detail-oriented person and so you're so good at you know kind of laying the framework for people it's like you know, look, besides getting your rabies titers and your rabies vaccines and your microchip, you've also got to think about all these little pieces of the puzzle that all have to be put together. And I, I, I think it's so important to have that resource. It's, you know, it's sort of like anything you want to do in life, you know, running a business. If you have a a set list of this is what I have to do to get this project to the finish line. That's critical. And particularly something like this as the, as the pet parent, 
your overwhelming concern is your pet. And so you spend so much time staring at them and thinking about them that you forget all the details that have to be put together to get them overseas, to get them through the procedure, to get them back home. So, uh, and having, it really does take a team. You've, you're going to have to have a team of doctors over here. You're going to have a team of doctors over there and coordinating that team can be really, really difficult. So I think what you're doing to help people, you know, know that framework to work within it, and having that checklist is just so incredibly helpful. So for anyone that who's watched, yeah, go ahead. Well, that does bring up a good point though, really quick. Um, just like even after surgery, a lot of the doctors don't understand life after repair. What is life after repair? I have clients that go downhill with, with mitral valve disease, um, just heart failure. Um, I know how to treat that. I treat it with Lasix and eventually, you know, a uh, harder Lasix. And um, that's what they know how to treat. But when they come back after repair, a lot of them don't know what life is after that. So if they do see changes, because it could happen, it happened to Zoe. Um, how do we combat that? Where we don't destroy the left side by doing something wrong um, and putting too much pressure on the left and blowing things out. Next thing you know, the repair is messed up. So mm -hmm is that we're seeing a huge challenge and I hope the doctors and these surgery centers can provide more educational um, information to uh, the future doctors, cardiologists, and that want to know what is life after repair? How do we watch for these things? How do we treat people that are kind of slipping here and there? It's not necessarily the same band-aid. Hmm. A, dog, uh, a doctor can treat the patient incorrectly and really cause things to go downhill. And we've had members, dogs, uh, pass away sadly because they were treated a little differently like the typical case of a heart failure dog and it's not it's resulted in death so got to be careful how they're treated and uh, always get the paperwork to japan or dwr or rbc and let them evaluate and so sometimes our doctors are waiting for that information from them to, uh, for their assessment to, to let them know what they think and they both kind of review and sometimes they measure, they read differently the echo measurements than we do in the U.S., like a different standard. So, and that's kind of led to confusion too. So there's confusion, there's language barriers, there's, <laughs> so it's just like anything else. You got to be very careful with your dogs and, and the decisions you make and make sure it's vetted two times, three times before you proceed to go down, you know, these holes. So, and I did want to touch really quick. So on the visa process, my partner, Michelle Lawson Fairfield, um, who's um, been, she's been instrumental in this whole thing during this whole situation in the world. And she's been helping people navigate their visa processes on how to apply for a visa. Because now in Japan, you have to have a visa to get into the country because they shut it down. Oh, jeez. And helping them with humanitarian visas to get into the country and it's a lot more paperwork on top of what we are to and typically uh the the lawyers in the u.s don't even know how to do this paperwork um we've had people try and, and they couldn't do it they defer to a japanese law firm and those people charge thirty thousand dollars to do that paperwork to get your dog into the country oh my gosh. right now during this so michelle has been helping over 50 people with zero failures on her visas to get them into the country for surgery uh, through her paralegal experience. And she's gotten these people into surgery when it would not be possible. And it would have cost $30,000. So that's kind of another, what we're doing now with our services is just getting these people in and saving as many as we can during this less travel process in this world. Wow. So it's not even the paperwork for the dog. We need the paperwork for the people as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. What a so, nightmare. Yeah. That's what kind of why I'm on Facebook and not doing anything because we've been hunkering down and we're literally in war mode where we're just focusing on saving as many as we can. Well, thank God for you guys for doing this work because I think as a as a private pet parent, and I even understand the veterinary side of the paperwork, 
But as a private pet parent, having to navigate that on my own, I wouldn't know where to start. And I, I would probably sit in the corner and cry because I wasn't able to help my dog. So, um, you know, this is amazing work. And anybody who has a pet with uh, or dog with mitral valve disease, I would strongly recommend getting on the Mighty Hearts Facebook page, looking at the Mighty Hearts website, because there's so much information. And the people that are going through this, not all the people on the page are having Having surgery done on their dogs. There's a lot of people just talking about how they're navigating everyday life with their dog with mitral valve disease. You know, I navigate it. Now I've got George as a B2, B1, sorry, B1. Um, and I've got uh, Stewie as a D. And it literally is a daily navigation, not so much with George, but definitely with Stewie. We've been in stage D for about 16 months now, and it is a, a daily. Nate and I used to have a lot of conversations when he was going through it with Zoe. What can I change? What can I tweak? How can I tweak the diet? What can I do with, um, you know, oxygen cages? What can I do with medication? Um, and so having that resource on the Mighty Hearts uh, website and Facebook page is just so helpful because the people that are on those pages are going through this on a daily basis and they have, they've learned a lot and they have a ton of information. So um, I would strongly recommend if you have a dog, even if you're not considering going through surgery, that you consider getting on that page, looking at the information, joining the conversation, because there's just a ton of information there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very loving community. We all help each other. Um, no one's perfect. You know, we all, we all learn and grow and that's the point of it. I'm not perfect. I'm still learning and growing. We're, we're all learning and growing and we just have to be open to helping each other out. And, and it's sometimes it's a very emotional process and yeah. people get a little crazy, but uh, you know, we just have to uh, realize what they're going through because we've lived it too. And uh, just, all I want to do and we, we want to do basically is just grow this organization to offer more services to help people going through this um, because we know uh, the pain of getting that diagnosis and saying there's nothing you can do. Your dog's pretty much going to die in a year and that's what most get and it's it's a painful thing to hear. So we, we just want to help people do whatever else can be done and start to show that really in the, in the long run of that these the other therapies and modalities can work. It's a, it's a shift of both, you, you know, that yeah. just we want to help them figure this out and, and, and save their dogs. It's all about the dogs. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Nate, is there anything we didn't cover? Uh, you're just a wealth of information. I could talk to you all day. I just want to make sure that anything you want people to know about that we've covered. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get yelled at for not getting all my ducks in a row on questions. <laughs> uh, you know, Hey, I had internet problems. My, my stuff was down. Yeah. Nate's, uh, Nate's the IT guy and his internet went down. So Nate, I'm going to get personal for a minute because sure. um, I mean, I know your story, but you went through this twice with your dog, your daughter, and uh, it affected your health. Um, and your well-being. Can, can we talk about that for just a minute? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, basically, I think since people don't realize what it took to start this organization, I I pretty much built the website. Well, I, I, I it was given to me during with my previous partners, and um, but I've been maintaining it, building it and growing it. And I do all the website development. I don't pay anyone to do it. I do the whole thing, and social media and everything. And I think between doing that, all of that work, talking to people day and night after my job, my full-time IT job, um, dealing with the terminal dog, basically, who had to go to surgery twice. I feel like I was just never stopping on battling, you know, it was just exhausting. And uh, I think in a couple of months after we did Zoe surgery, and I think she had it in February of 2019 and in September of 2019, I had a heart attack myself. <laughs> I was just going to pick up stuff for my wife and came home and told her all this stuff. And she's like, we're going to the emergency room. And she had experience with her dad with that. So she knew what to do. So we grabbed Zoe. We grabbed my wife. We went to the emergency room and that's when they said, Oh, you're having a heart attack right now. What? 
I thought I was going to be like those movies where, oh, you just have gas. <laughs> and, you know, like, but when I see them tear off the EKG and bring it to the doctor and he rushes over there, like, oh, shoot. I was like, uh oh, this is not going to be like the movies. <laughs> so he told me I was having a heart attack right there. And then I was signing the paperwork, uh, you know, for the admittance stuff. And it's kind of funny to me, but my wife doesn't think so. Uh, I was signing the paperwork and as, as I'm signing away, uh, the eyes went in the back of my head and I, I went into cardiac arrest. So now they're like code blue and they're all rushing in there and they, they, uh, zap me with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, patches one zap to get my heart out of what 300 beats or so per minute. So they zap me pretty much rushed me into the catheter lab, you know, where they, they go into your groin and they put, a, uh, uh, um, basically a stent into your heart. So I'm here. I am sitting here, uh, you know, an hour after I was just getting food for my wife, uh, to sitting in a in a cath lab, watching them on the TV, going into my heart, fishing through my vein, and watching them do the dye and the puff. And I see my heart, and I see the blockages, and I'm just sitting there watching. And I was awake the whole time, and I'm just cracking jokes to them, and and I'm just like, wow, I was just here getting food, and here I am having a heart attack. So I ended up having three stents, which I'm good now. Uh, just eating better, sleeping more and not pushing myself so hard. So, and that's kind of what, you know, I know about the hearts for the dogs. I didn't need to go through this. Uh, whatever God's doing, cut it out. <laughs> uh, just figured you need to have a hands-on personal experience. <laughs> Peace. I don't know. Or, we say, or he was saying, slow down. Yeah, it, it, it takes a lot to do all this and, and to start a 501c3 and, and to go through all of this stuff. You know, you've pretty much built an empire of goodness. It's not easy. That's all the, all the gray hairs in my head from all that. Yeah. So, so well, we're glad you're still with us and we're glad you. that you're able to help these families navigate this path because it's not easy. Um, but to everyone watching and listening, we are so thankful for Nate. We are so thankful for what he does and so thankful heart for the Mighty Hearts Project community because uh, it is a wealth of information. So hopefully this has been helpful. And even for those of you who are not interested in having surgery on your dogs, uh, just knowing that it's available, maybe you'll be talking to somebody in the grocery store or a neighbor who has a dog going through this and you mention it and they go, oh my gosh, I need this information. So, Nate, thank you for everything that you do. I'm hoping yeah. that sometime this year we'll be able to get together in person <laughs> that, now that we're oh. sort of opening up a little bit again. Uh, actually, yeah. planning on being in Southern California October 1st weekend. So maybe oh. we can maybe and we can hook up. Yep. And I did see one question that if, if, my, um, if Michelle doesn't have me ask, she's going to kill me. Uh, she just wanted me to ask about the, um, we get this a lot. What's the importance of taking vet med on an empty stomach? You hear it, you should take it on an empty stomach, should not take it on an empty stomach. And doctors say, go ahead and do it. Uh, you might lose some absor absorption, but and we hear it a lot. And I'm just like, uh, I would say take it on an empty stomach, but then people say, I have my dog has diarrhea, blah, blah, blah. So what's your answer to it? My answer is, if you can take it on an empty stomach, take it on an empty stomach, because the drug manufacturer even says that. Yeah. But if you have tummy issues and upset and your dog's throwing it up, you might have to just lose it, a little bit of absorption just to get it in them. Yeah. Yeah. I've always sure. given it with food. <laughs> um just because it's a little crazy here <laughs> trying to get everybody mm -hmm. fed and medicated and whatever, and, you know, birth kittens in the morning. So, um, I, my dogs have always done fine. Uh, maybe I'm losing a little bit of absorption. Maybe we're dosing them a little bit higher because of that. I don't really know. Um, I haven't seen issues. So what I would say to people, particularly like I know our Shana really struggled with all the drugs with uh, GI issues. And I've only had a couple of patients that we've actually found that they were absolutely not going to tolerate the drug uh, due to GI issues. And that does make life a little a little more challenging if they're not going to tolerate the drug at all. So because it, it truly is a one of a kind drug, the, the Pimavendin. Yeah. So. And 
uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville, uh, their pharmacy was actually telling people um, not to use those quad tabs, you know, those little like Wedgwood mm -hmm. quad tabs because they're not made with citric acid and the absorption is not as good. So you're not getting the benefit of the medication versus the original. Right. So a lot of them are like, so I'm looking into that, that they highly recommend that you don't uh, use those because they don't work as well. Right. Yeah, I know that because uh, I talked to a couple of the compounding pharmacies and if you're going to have, which I get my Pimabendin compounded, I don't use quad mm -hmm. tabs. Uh, but if you're going to get it compounded, there are other substances that have to be in with it uh, in, in order to enhance the absorption and actually make it work. So uh, you have to have a compounding pharmacy who really understands mm -hmm. how it needs to be formulated. So there definitely is a difference with the compounding. Yep. And I won't go into like the, the, the what is a murmur, heart murmur, because I know you discussed it in your previous week. I would tell them to go watch that unless you want to just quickly elaborate on it. No. And you know what? A murmur, a murmur doesn't mean um, heart failure and a murmur doesn't mean uh, mitral valve disease. I mean, you can have murmurs that are innocent. So um, we talked about that kind of at the beginning of the week, I think on Monday, uh, and that video is still up. But um so, you know, you definitely have to, it's very difficult for people. I got an email from somebody this morning. They don't have a cardiologist in their country. Uh, so we're counting on the, you know, general practitioners to uh, decide, <clears throat> decide what's going on based on, you know, doing echocardiogram, doing ultrasounds themselves um, and not having that cardiology referral or cardiologist to look at it. And uh, so, from everything that I know about this dog and all the other tests that have been run, they're saying it's a B2, but there's no heart enlargement. The pro BNP is normal. So I look at that and say, why would we start this dog on Pimo Benden? But the local veterinarian said, oh, I think we need to start it on Pimo Benden. So that becomes a, a, a subjective opinion as to when it's time to start. And so I find that that's the trickiest part of regulating the mitral valve disease, depending on your cardiologist or your veterinarian. Some of them want to jump in really early with the Pimobendin. Some of them are uh, wanting to wait a little bit longer on the Pimobendin. So um, that's going to be subjective. And uh, if you are, are kind of questioning the answer, maybe get a second opinion. Yeah. And some, some dogs don't do well on Pimo Bendy. And I've seen right. Zoe's heart just race like hell. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's a hard thing. So. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, Nate, thank you so much. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you for getting up early on the West Coast to join us. We really appreciate it. Everyone, if you have questions, go on that Mighty Hearts Facebook page. And uh, Nate's on there a lot. And, and all the people on there are just great about uh, chatting with everybody. Yeah, and just go to mightyheartsproject.org so you can uh, find all of our connections to our Facebook page, our, our group, our business page, and obviously our website information that helps you and gets a hold of us too. Yep. Perfect. Nate, thanks so much. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Supporters, I'll see you tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Bye. Bye-bye.